Uh, okay, first of all, a big good evening and welcome to the 1907 Lounge here at the Crown Oil Arena for tonight's Rochdale Football Club Fans Forum. Thank you for coming. Uh, as you can see, it is going to be very, very busy tonight and we've got a lot to get through. Uh, we're going to introduce you to the top table, first of all, in a minute. Before we do that, though, as you may have seen on the official social media pages and on the website as well, we are doing it a little bit different to normal tonight. There is going to be a chance a little bit later on for you to ask questions to the top table, but before we do that tonight, there is going to be a few presentations off of a few of our board of directors. Uh, before we start, just in case you don't know anything, I will introduce you to the top table. Starting at the left as you look at the table, uh, is our Director of Sales and Marketing, Mrs. Francis Fielding. Next to Mrs. Fielding is our, I'm sure you already know that one, our first team manager, Brian Barry Murphy. <laughs> Next to BBM is one of our directors, Mr. Graham Rawlinson. Next to Mr. Rawlinson is our Director and Chief Executive, Mr. David Bottomley. Uh, next to Mr. Bottomley is our Chairman, Mr. Andrew Kilpatrick. Next to Mr. Kilpatrick, uh, is Mr. Tony Pockney, who is one of our directors as well. Uh, next to Tony is Nick, Mr. Nick Grimlock. You may not have seen Nick before. Uh, Nick's our external accountant, so thank you for joining us tonight, Nick. Uh, next to Nick is, of course, Mr. John Smallwood, who is um, get this out right, assistant associate director and club secretary. And then, of course, it is the academy director, Mr. Andrew Kelly. So that's your top table tonight. Like I say, in a bit, there is going to be a chance for you to ask questions. Before you ask questions tonight, what we're going to do, because obviously it is really busy, we could be here all night, we're going to start at this side of the room and work our way right round. So if you are going to ask questions tonight, as I come round, please do stop me. And like I say, we're going to start at this side of the room and work the way down to there. We're going to be doing that a little bit later on, because as I did say, we have got some presentations, first of all. So, to start off and officially open the night, we'd like to introduce it to our chairman, Mr. Andrew Kilpatrick. Hi, good evening, and thank you all very much for um, coming along on this sort of a cold and um, windy night. Uh, this is our first forum of the year, and... Um, we hope that it will provide some insight to what we're trying to do with the club. Um, as Dave said, we're going to have four presentations. David Bottomley will kick off with a general overview of uh, what's going on with the club. Tony, who is our finance director, will then make a presentation on the club's finances. Andrew Kelly will talk to us about uh, what's going on with the academy. Francis um, will then give a commercial overview of where we are and what we're trying to achieve and um, Brian will also uh, then be able to talk a little bit about um, footballing matters and at the end of it we will then be available for any questions you may have but um, first of all again thank you very much indeed and I'm going to hand over to David. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, David Bottomley uh, was introduced Chief Executive and a Director of the club. I've uh, been on the board since 2015 and been Chief Executive for about the last 14 months. Um, welcome tonight. Um, I'm delighted, I think we all are, to see such a big turnout. I'm not going to delay you for very long because I think there are some more meteor presentations that you'll be looking forward to um, tonight. Um, what I would like to say is that all of us here tonight share the same aim. And that is, we're all committed to recognising the history of this great club and those who have served this club over 112 years. The legacy of that service by both supporters and directors and employees of this club is that for a six successive season, we're now maintaining uh, English Football League One status and very much online to achieve a seventh consecutive uh, season next year, which is fantastic. I think we all recognise the issues in this town that affect a club with comparatively low attendances in the football league. I think we're all committed, both the supporters and the board and everybody connected with the club, to maintaining where we are as a very minimum within the football pyramid. We all share the passion to increase the revenue of this club and we all share the desire to ensure that in 112 years' time there are people in this room or maybe a rebuilt stand by then sharing the same goals and ideas that we all share today. And whatever our backgrounds, wherever we've come from and whatever our thoughts, 
surely at all times the most overriding thing about being involved with this club <laughs> is we all care about the wonderful club that Rochdale Football Club is. Um, some questions. Um, where has the cut money gone? Why do we sell our best players? Why don't you back the manager? Where is there a multimillionaire in Rochdale? How does the club exist on such low gates? Why do we need a training ground? Will the club ever get promoted? Is the board capable of running the club? Are these tonight's questions or have these been asked before? Well, the answer to this, if anybody's written a, a, read a book called Kicking in the Wind, written by Derek Olsop, at a fans forum in March of 1994, these questions were asked of Graham Morris and Andrew Kilpatrick. So here we are many, many years later uh, with the club almost <coughs> prospering and surviving with people determined to ask the same questions. So in real terms in football, nothing ever changes. And I hope you'll see tonight that with the presentations that have been put together, particularly on finance, we'll address a lot of the issues that you all care about at the bottom of your heart with regards to Rochdale. Um, I never uh, feel ashamed of showing where we've come from as a club. Uh, I first stood on these terraces in 1968. Um, and to be where we are today with this magnificent stadium that holds 10,000 people, I think, again, is a major achievement to everybody who served this club. And I, we are respected as a football club. Uh, when myself or John Smallwood or the chairman go to meetings of the Football League, uh, Rochdale have amazing respect throughout the whole of the 71 club uh, Football League uh, membership. Just some very basic figures on um, the EFL. Last season, 2018-19, uh, saw record attendances in the Championships League 1 and 2. The average crowd across all three divisions was 11,000. League 1 and 2 attendances were the highest since 1959. Total League 1 attendances last year were nearly 5 million people came to a League 1 game. And on Boxing Day last year, in 2018, um, Sunderland attracted the second biggest crowd of the day behind Liverpool in the Premiership. And our own crowds, uh, we complain about how low they are, but actually last year saw our highest average attendances since 1972. So a big thank you to all of you here in terms of driving that, because I stood here in the dark days of the 70s when we used to announce the crowd is 1174, but we all knew there were only about 600 people in the ground. In terms of some very brief statistics, to be even more proud of where we are in the football pyramid, uh, EFL 1 is the fifth largest league in Europe from a crowd size point of view, and from a revenue point of view, we're operating in the fourth richest league in Europe. <coughs> Nearly £20 million will come into uh, Football League this year uh, in sponsorship, driven by Sky at £8.45 million, Caribou at £7 million, EA Sports at £2 million, Leasing.com at 700,000. But you have to counter that 19.44 million that will come into 71 clubs against the minimum payment to a premiership club of 108 million through Sky TV. So we're all facing an uphill battle to maintain where we are. I'm going to cover a subject now that's probably close to everybody's heart, and especially because um, we were one of only two games in the Football League and the Premiership called off on Saturday, and that's the pitch. And so I'm going to stand here and tell you the whole truth behind the pitch and what we're actually going to be doing going forward. There were two new pitches laid in less than a two-year period. Um, the February pitch, 2018, the Tottenham pitch, we actually paid for it. <clears throat> Excuse me, virtually every club, club that visits us here on a match day says, well, your pitch was paid for by Tottenham. Uh, no, it wasn't actually, we paid for it ourselves. The pitches were laid down, uh, both pitches were bought from the same supplier, and both pitches were installed and laid down without any guarantee as to their either suitability or um, their longevity. And the pitches were basically laid down without addressing the time um, immemorial, immemorial um, problem here, and that is the continual issue of drainage in one of the wettest clubs in the entire football league. We also laid a carpet surface when the majority of experts say that's the wrong surface for a town of this rainfall. We're also now suffering complete reputational damage. Um, we actually contacted Swindon Town today, who were the only other club who postponed a game on Saturday. 
Swindon actually postponed their game because of crowd safety issues, that advertising hoardings were being blown by the severe winds onto the pitch. So we were the only club out of 36 fixtures on Saturday across the Premiership and the Football League that lost a game because of the condition of the pitch. I myself personally went to Oldham on Saturday afternoon uh, when this game was called off. And the Oldham groundsman was actually on the verge of putting the sprinklers on before oh. the start of the game because their pitch was so dry. So that tells you that we have a real issue with drainage. Um, we have since August of 2019 uh, looked at, we've seen five major pitch contractors. Incidentally, all of them claim to, claim to have laid Wembley. It's quite funny actually when about the third one came in the boardroom and they said, well, when did you lay Wembley? Um, we've seen five major contractors. They've all presented to the board on this occasion, which wasn't the case before when two pitches were purchased in uh, 2017 and 18. And they've all been thoroughly researched and everybody is aware of the rainfall statistics of this town. Every contractor we've had in understands the climate conditions at Rochdale. And all of them understand addressing the issue that they call what lies beneath. And this is the biggest problem at Rochdale. Uh, at a previous fans forum we got slightly um, laughed at for saying the drains don't know where which drains to go into. But it's very true, we have a drainage system on this pitch currently that is not fit for purpose. And the two pitches that have been laid in the last few years should not have been laid on top of the existing drains. So we have commissioned major work to commence, literally on the 4th of May. Um, the season finishes on the 3rd of May, but we're commencing work on the 4th. It's a massive investment. You're going to ask later, and Tony will address where all the money goes, but the investment we're making in the pitch is absolutely huge. But this time we're making it with a supplier who has a fantastic reputation and a supplier that will back us with a 10-year guarantee on the pitch. So if anything goes wrong and we've kept to their maintenance programmes, we'll end up with a new pitch. And literally, we're going to go back 100 years to when this ground was built. I read a comment on the forum the other week about digging up the whole of the ground and they're not far from the truth. We're going to go massively down in the surface. If anybody would like to make an offer to buy the um, deposits that we'll take away, that would be great for the receive because one of the biggest costs of actually laying a new pitch is getting rid of what you've actually got. Um, we are supported now by an excellent ground staff here at the football club and I will pay them tribute because from a training perspective this year we should have been using both Platte Lane and the local cricket club. <coughs> Um, Brian will tell you we've only we've been to Platte Lane I think once since uh, the beginning of July when the players came back from pre-season training and that's because our ground staff have maintained the pitches of the cricket club to a standard required for professional footballers. So it'll be no mean achievement in doing what we're doing but it will mean and Rochdale Hornets have been very aware of this for some time that no sport will be played, played on this ground between the 4th of May and the 1st of August. So we're investing in a new pitch. It's been done properly this time. It's been done with the full knowledge of everybody on the board. And it's been done in a very calculated way that gives Rochdale Football Club the surface we need to play the sort of football that Brian Barry Murphy wants to play on it in all conditions. It's easy, you know, we all sometimes take the mickey out of clubs like Accrington and we do that wrongly because they invested 400,000 pounds in the summer to ensure that on Saturday they got three points. And as the people on the Quest programme on Saturday night said, that sees Accrington mid-table and safe for another year in League One. And that, in real terms, should have been Rochdale on Saturday when we played Tranmere. As an update to the match we lost on Saturday, uh, because of the potential damage to our reputation and the inquest from the Football League, we took a decision this morning to bring in the balloon covers tomorrow in order that we may get Saturday's game against Coventry on. And the reason we've taken that decision is that yesterday morning I spent much time looking at weather forecasts and the forecast is actually for rain in Rochdale from today, every day, until the 3rd of March. So by doing what we're doing with the covers, it'll allow the ground staff time to get underneath and prepare the pitch and hopefully have a great surface for Brian's team to play football and beat Coventry on Saturday. 
So that's it on the pitch. Uh, you've got a lot of things that will come on to tonight. I want to keep this fairly brief because there's some very important presentations. But one thing I'd like you to ponder as we go through tonight is where do we go as a football club? And that is, <clears throat> where do we go with season tickets? How do we attract more family audiences to football? Because every football club in the Football League has many of the same issues as we do. And without being unkind to a number of people in here, the majority of the audience in this room tonight is my white male and over 50. And that's not where the future of football has to be. We love all of you as season ticket holders. We love all of you as fans. But everybody has a duty to help try and take this club forward into a, a new era. We want you to support us till the day you die because we feel that way about Rochdale. But like every other club at our level in League One and Two, we have to find new ways of bringing people in. We do need investment to make the club more attractive. Um, one of the things we've been discussing in the board meeting this afternoon is that the town hall closes for two and a half years. And that opens up a lot of opportunities in the town to sell venues for weddings and conferences. And we want to be very much in that. And it would be a lot easier to be in there if we could have an investment that would spend three or four hundred thousand pounds on this stand that you're in tonight. We also want to develop further our success as an academy. Um, Andrew will give a very good presentation on our academy. And it goes without saying that without the academy and without Andrew Kelly persuading the board many years ago to continue with the academy, none of us will be sat in this room tonight. Um, and we all from a personal point of view and from the board, we want to maintain the values in this club of our supporters and all the values that have made us the club we are and served us so well in our history. So from me, thank you. I hope that's given you an honest update on where we are with the pitch. Hopefully it's given you the confidence to say, I know the game's going to be on on Saturday and the confidence that says the board actually has addressed all the issues and next season we're making a massive investment in order to hopefully get to a point where we'll never have any cancellations in a football match. So for now, that's me. Thank you very much indeed. I'll hand over to Tony. Well, so a very passionate, very eloquent, uh, and some expose facts as well that you haven't heard before. So how the hell do you follow that? Um, well, the only way I could think of is a six-hour roller coaster of facts and figures of financials, and uh, there will be a test afterwards. Um, and it's subtitled, Where's the Bloody Money Gone? So, um, first of all, I've, I've met a number of you in the room, but not everyone, so I wanted to take the opportunity just to uh, do a quick introduction as well. You may have noticed that uh, I don't have a Rochdale, Rochdale accent. I'm still trying. Um, it's a southern accent. Um, I was born in Surrey, for some reason I was a Tottenham fan, I used to sing Tottenham till I die, not when we played them here, I'll tell you that. Um, it, it's, uh, it was certainly now uh, Tottenham till I move, I've moved, I've been here for 25 years now, and it's Rochdale till I die, without a doubt. Um, so 25 years living here. Rochdale born wife, Alison over there, supporting, friendly face in the crowd. Um, <laughs> Rochdale born kids as well, and one of, the, one of them's here as well, Tim. Uh, I'm a, I have been a season ticket holder for a number of years. I'm a shareholder. Sadly, I am not a millionaire or a billionaire, if only. Um, next, next myth I wanted to just quickly dispel. Um, as a director and as a director team, um, no income from this club. And no expenses for travelling for match days either. And I know that's cropped up on forum comments and posts in the past, but we, we don't claim anything. We just enjoy going to, to the games. Um, don't take any remuneration, but I do and, and, and I can. I'm lucky enough to be able to give time and energy to the club. And um, I'm partially retired, so I'm doing between two and sometimes four or five days a week here, um, plus match days. I'm proud to have spent my first year now on the board, um, and I, you know, I am happy to be contacted. Um, so, on a match day, I'm wandering around. Do come up and see me. Yeah, I'm quite happy to sit and talk and answer questions, um, or in between, you know, over, over email as well. Um, don't, I don't respond well to um, threats of violence or death threats, but other than that, everything <laughs> else is fair game. 
So um, on to um, on, on to the uh, the finances presentation. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the Rochdale finances, a bit about the state of football. We can then talk about um, the accounts that have just gone in, and some of you have already dismembered um, from company's house and pulled apart, and I'm sure you have questions. We'll talk a bit about a comparison to the prior year as well. Um, then a bit about this year and financial strategy going forward. Um, you may not be able to see all the figures um, and the percentages on here. In fact, you guys may not be able to see all of them either. Um, but you know, if there are any burning questions as we go through the slide deck, please feel free to um, give us a shout. If you want to talk about something that's not on the slides, I'd ask you just to save it for later on because we'll, you know, there will be time for other questions. Um, in terms of the kind of the 101 on, on, on Rochdale finances, though, the first thing to say is there are two companies. I don't know how many of you know that. Um, so there's Rochdale AFC Limited and Deanhurst Park Limited. And Deanhurst Park, fully owned by Rochdale AFC, um, but it owns the stadium and gets certain revenues from that stadium. Now, interestingly, um, and when I first arrived on the board, we had a mad scramble to get the accounts out um, prior year. And um, we decided to consolidate the accounts because when we looked at it, only one side of the house was being reported. So in the past, you were seeing um, profits from the football club, but actually there were losses in Deanhurst Park. So the football club wasn't paying Deanhurst Park enough to actually make money and be solvent. So we decided as a board to give you the full picture or give the shareholders the full picture and, and uh, combine the accounts. So now, for the last two years, you've got the whole picture, the stadium company and the football club itself. Our accounting year is the end of May. So we close off 31st of May um, and then we start the, the process of um, reporting. And the accounts are published, um, the deadline is the end of February. So actually, we've published early. Now, frankly, we could have published in, in January, but um, if you've read ahead or you've seen, you know, the, the, the results weren't great for last year. And we didn't want to publish at a time we were getting into a transfer window because we could have been, you know, a red flag to any club coming in to swoop for our players thinking that we were at a financial disadvantage. So we held the, we held the accounts back until we got through that, that, that window to, and then presented them then. Um, once the accounts are um, completed and submitted to company's house, they then get um, circulated to the shareholders. That's been done by uh, John in the last few days. Uh, and then we take them to an AGM, and that's where uh, we get a load of detailed questions. And so we might not be able to answer all the questions tonight that you may have about you know, accruals and um, accounting treatments and that sort of thing. Um, if you're a shareholder, come along to the AGM, and uh, that's where we discuss things like that. So um, the accounts get approved at that point. Um, in terms of how we generate them and how we run the, uh, the finances, um, we've got two very hardworking ladies in the accounts office here. We're then supported by Nick and his colleagues at, uh, at Greenrods, and we are fully audited, both sides of the house now, so um, the, the same company didn't use to get audited, but we're fully audited by uh, WMG in, in, in Rochdale as well. In fact, they do our payroll. Um, the other thing to mention about uh, this business is it is uh, very much a cash flow business. So, um, you know, sometimes money comes in and that's great, but um, we have to be watching the, the bank balances like hawks all the time. Um, it's really important that we can get through to the end of the season and pay our players, pay our very hard-working staff, pay the bloody HMRC because they don't give you any, you know, any, any let up at all, uh, and then you know, particularly all our um, all our local suppliers, we like to get the, get them paid as well. And we, we you know we pride ourselves in every month the payroll goes out. And you'll have read um, you know about about problems at other clubs where you know, players haven't been paid for months, staff haven't been paid for months, uh, and motivation and morale just goes out the window. You know we really really run a tight ship here to make sure that that priority um, happens all the time. And actually, because of the losses we made last year, we've had to do a cash flow analysis 
for the next 18 months to show we can be solvent, we can trade all the way through that period. But that is going to mean, you know, we have to run a very tight ship through that period as well. So that's the introduction. Um, generally, um, in terms of yeah, the state of football finance, I mean, it's pretty well documented that football is unlike any other business. Most clubs in football just don't make any money. Um, and it really is a strange old business. Um, so it's in a very poor state unless you're one of the very few. And even though it's very few now, I mean, you see Manchester City, nice problem to have, but they've always got too much money. And they've been flushing too much money through the club. So even when you've got too much, you've got problems. So it, it is a challenge. I mean, I've been reading a book about, um, on, called On the Brink. Uh, it's about the Northwest Football Club. Simon Harris wrote it. Fantastic book. But it sort of documents a load of clubs in, in, you know, just in our area and how they have the daily, weekly, monthly struggle to, um, to, 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 to actually get a decent outturn. Uh, and it is very difficult. And we know, you know, very, very, very public, but Bolton, Macclesfield, Oldham, you know, all with their financial struggles, and that's to name but a few. And we go round the clubs uh, all the time. We talk to the... Uh, the owners and the FDs and the board, uh, and you know, and they all really struggle to make ends meet. So, um, and the difference with us, you know, we're owned by shareholders, a number of you probably in the room, um, but we don't have a benevolent owner who has the opportunity to just open their wallet and throw, throw money at the club. And there's so many clubs out there that are bankrolled to the tune of, you know, a million, two million, three million a year just to make ends meet. We don't have that luxury. So um, we've got to, through financial cycles, and maybe not every year, but over a, a, a period of two or three years, on average, we've got to break even because the money's not coming from anywhere else. There's no magic money tree. So, um, yeah, and, and the last point, you know, football finance being as it is, you know, the banks will not give us an overdraft. So, um, you know, we have to maintain a positive balance all the time. And when we had a cash flow problem earlier in the um, last year, and it didn't look as though we were going to be able to make our HMSRC payment in time, we rang them up, asked for a few weeks' grace, no chance. So um, in the end, actually, a number of the directors had to put a short-term loan into the club. Took it, we got it out again as well, but we had to, 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 to float the club through a difficult period to make sure that we met our obligations. So, um, you know, none of this is excuses, it's just, you know, it's just a fact of the environment that we operate in, um, but it is a challenging environment, and when you challenge us, you know, this is some of the rationale for, for some of the tough decisions we have to make. So, 2018-19, um, so last season, um, as I said, the, the accounts are now available on Companies House, so... If you're a shareholder, you've got them, and you've got a bit of extra detail in the back that we don't have to publish at Company's House. The rest of you, if you're really, really interested, yeah, go, go you, can, you can go and have a look on Company's House yourselves. Um, it's the second year, as I say, of consolidated accounts. Prior years, um, only published for RAFC, and we posted a 1.2 million loss last year. 1.2 million loss. Um, Prior year, we made a, a 300k loss. So, um, yeah, we, we, luckily, we had some cash going in there that actually got us through those two years. But it's really challenging. And so, we had to make some changes this year. And you'll see some of that coming through that um, have actually helped bring us back into, into Kilter again. So, um, what I've tried to do, and uh, you know, you'll only be able to see big segments, and I'll do a bit of a weather map for you. But um, what we've tried to do is just contrast, you know, what, what income do we get and where does it come from? And what's the expenditure? Now, the expenditure last year was 6.2 million, and the income was five. So we're already big red segment there. That's the shortfall. That's the shortfall we, we, we face through the year. Um, the, when you look at where the money came from for to, uh, to, to make up that income, then biggest chunk is the league and the FA monies. Um, so that, you know, the, the, the drawdown from, uh, for, 
uh, for TV, football rights, and from premiership. So that was about 25%. Gate receipts added up to about 13% of what we were needed to break even. So actually, gate receipts are a very low uh, proportion of our income at the moment. Now, as David alluded, you know, we want the stadium full. We want the stadium bouncing, and you know, of course, that will be uh, fantastic for the atmosphere, but also it's really going to be really important for the balance sheet. So, you know, a big plea to you all, take the good news story out, you know, out, out there to your friends and family, and get them, get them into Rochdale as well to really you know, share in this fantastic club and this, this, this intimate football experience. Um, transfer fees uh, last year were 16% of what we needed. So again, a really big chunk and a really important chunk. So, you know, I know we hate to sell our best players. Or, you know, and it's, and it's a tough decision every time. But the only way we make the numbers is by developing and selling those players. And then we get the add-ons later on as well, which is absolutely vital. And it's great for the, you know, it's, it's a great story because we've developed them, we've had the opportunity to get some benefit from them, um, and then we move them on and we see them go from strength to strength, we hope. Um, but it is actually a really important part of the equation in terms of making ends meet. Other than that, um, sponsorship donations, 5%. TV and broadcasting last year, 1%. That's just bad, no cup runs and no, and, and no money. So, um, and we don't think we had any TV games last, last season either, did we? So, so you know, very, very little contribution there. VIP, bars and catering, um, so executive club, people dining in here, around about 6%. Um, we have some, I mean, we've got a fantastic offer here. Francis and the team do a fantastic job. Um, some days it's absolutely jam full and it's a fantastic atmosphere. Other days, not so much so. So if you're corporate and you do corporate entertaining, what better place to come and invest in your club and increase that, that segment? Um, so, you know, and you'll be, you always get a well, warm welcome, but you'll get a warm welcome from me financially as well. Um, prize money, 2%. Shop sales, 3%. Um, and stadium income, so rents from uh, some of the from the lettings uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the building, one percent. So, you know, big chunks. You know, the big message is, um, you know, apart from the stuff that we get from the league, we need to do better on gates, and we are going to have to continue to be a selling club. You know, there's the, there's no way about it. Um, just a quick comparison to. To the prior year, um, the big standouts for me is um, there were you know, stadium income held up okay, shop and sales fine, prize money way down, TV and broadcasting way down, sponsorship and donations somewhat down, gate receipts down, and that's pretty much a function of our um, of our cup runs. Prior year, great cup runs. And you can build on that fantastically. So it's great because we get extra um, sponsorship opportunities, um, and we've been very successful on those this year again. So you know, if we don't if, if we don't get those cup runs, we we really suffer financially. In terms of the you know where does that money go? So six point two million last year. Um, well, a huge chunk, thirty nine percent goes on just the players and the loan players. And then you add in the, the, the coaching and youth wages at 17%. Brian, that's not all, that's not all Brian's salary, by the way. <laughs> Most, 16%. That's, you know, that, that's you know, all, the, all the backroom staff and the academy coaches as well. Um, so, you know, it's an expensive setup. And actually, you know, we had, um, we had Keith Hill uh, and Chris Beath's severance in all of that as well, so that increased that for last year. Um, first team travel at 5%, pitch, stadium and training facilities 4%, and it kind of you know, dwindles down. You've got back office salaries at 7%. Um, yeah, the, the, the team here um, 
benchmark really very, very well in terms of we don't pay people very much. So not ideal for them, but fantastic for the club. We've got really, really committed, um, committed staff. Um, but actually, you know, they're not paid a fortune here. You know, they, 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 they do it for the love, they do it for the passion. Um, and, you know, I do, I do see rumours and, and, you know, again, the posts about, about um, salaries and wages, um, they're, they're very low, actually. Um, legal and accounting, 1%. That's, yeah, that's a bit of ex external support. A bargain, isn't it? Um, you know, and, and again, you know, the comparisons, and they held up um, pretty, pretty much um, last year. So, yeah, the, big, the, the player wage bill um, was about the same, a little bit more actually last year than there was the, pre the previous year. We spent a bit more on coaching and, and youth wages, but I've alluded to why. Um, good work by David and others, just notching down the first team travel costs, so renegotiating, changing suppliers, being just a little bit more careful on when we stay away and when, 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 when the team um, just day travel, because um, every little helps. Um, we've also you know, cut the costs of um, some of our, uh, where is it? Yeah, the back office, the back office salaries. Um, so, you know, we just cut some of the hours in the shop and the ticket office. And again, I've seen posts about, you know, Tim Pot Club, bloody shops shut. Well, actually, we've done the analysis. Not many people come in on a Monday, shut the shop, saved on the wages, and we can put it all back into the pot. So, you know, we're making some of these just difficult decisions to you know, try and maximise our return, to try and balance the books, and to get as much money out onto the pitch for your entertainment as we can. Um, so, so that's prior years. Now, just going on to, the, to, to this year. Um, again, we started the year with a big black hole in the budget, uh, and I really didn't know where it's going to come from. Um, and very limited cash in the bank as well, so it was a you know was was a struggle. Um, Brian, we you know we worked with on the uh, on on the player budget for the year. Actually, we did trim it uh, at the beginning of the year because of the injury situation, because of a number of requests. We have actually notched it back up again, um, but you know we started with the good intentions, and because of that, you know we haven't strayed too far, which is which is good news as well. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're continuing on the, the, the voyage of just keeping a, keeping a lid on all our costs, so the team travel costs, the, the shop hours, um, the player sales and the post sales and add-ons, you know, they've, they've been a, a, a real boon. Um, so you know, Craig Dawson money, um, for instance, West Brom to Watford, fantastic, you know, lo lovely sell on there. Uh, we get a chunk. The bad news is we don't get it now. We're not actually seeing that money until next season, half of it, and the season after. And that's just the way the, the contract was negotiated between West Brom and Watford. But, you know, it's not just a little old Rochdale that, that, that lose out, it's West Brom as well. So it's just amazing. Even these big clubs are, you know, cash flow strapped, and so they're having to do deals. We're having to accept those, the, the, those deals. But the good news is it does drop money into the budget for future years. We do see it on the PL this year, so it will look as though we make a, you know, a bigger profit, but in cash terms, it comes later. Um, the job the team have done on the pitch in our, in our cup competitions has been fantastic. The guys that pick the balls out of the, out of the hats for us as well, I mean, goodness, what intervention there to have United... Um, Manchester United and Newcastle. So fantastic experience for you guys, fantastic experience for the team, bloody good for the coffers as well. So um, with that, with the sale of Luke um, as well, you know, and I know it wasn't wildly popular, but uh, and there may be some questions on that later, but you know, from a financial perspective, you know, very, very healthy. Um, it means now I can see that cash flow through for the next 18 months which is absolutely vital, you know, it's the lifeblood of the, the club and it just keeps the whole thing running. What it doesn't mean actually is we're sitting on a mountain of gold that we want to spend or we can spend because we've got to, you know, really work hard to make sure we retain it over that period. So the PL is looking very positive for the year. We continue to track that. 
Um, the cash flow is positive now for the rest of the season, still and, and for 18 months, based on some assumptions though. So it's not all in the bank. You know, we've got to we've got to perform on the pitch. Or, you know, we've got to make sure that you know certain things don't go wrong. Um, there is some room in the budget though for some key things, and David alluded to the pitch. Um, you know, that's an absolutely critical one. You know, I, I was losing sleep over um, where we were going to find the money for that. Um, but the recent windfalls, you know, that that goes towards that critical investment, so that we can play great football on a great surface in front of you guys. Um, and the other thing, which is you know, my, my pet project at the moment, is replacing the, the ticketing system and the entry system. So, um, and we're going to have to make some investments on that. Our ticketing system and retail systems, actually, you know, they, they stopped trading in um, end of May this year. So we've got to invest in, uh, in, in a new solution. The good news is we're going to get you know get into some you know scanning or automated turnstiles as well, bring the club up to you know, up, up, up into the 21st century, and it's going to allow us to do some exciting things around season tickets and membership. And you'll hear more of that. We did start to test some of those ideas at a ticketing forum, uh, and there'll be another one in um, a month or so to test more of those ideas with you. Um, Longer term, do we have a plan? Well, you know, we are buffeted by um, headwinds and sidewinds and whatever. You know, just just when you think you've got things sorted, then um, you know something comes along, and something came along the other day. Fire alarm. We had to spend a fortune on a fire alarm to keep you know keep keep the place safe and uh, safe and secure. Um, David's mentioned the dome that we're going to have to erect doesn't come cheap but absolutely vital but um, long term you know this is all about for me at least financial stability so trying to plan to break even or better it's not going to come good every year but if we can come good one or two out of three and you know depending how often you know it's got to have to come come good pretty well um, but you know that that's what we've got to aim for <coughs> Um, no financial engineering, so no sale and lease back of the ground, um, no mixing and melding the, you know, the club finances with someone's business finances and it getting murky like clubs nearby. Um, really, really important. So keep it, keep it simple, keep it transparent and you know, allow us to manage the business. We want to invest as much as we can into the playing budget. So, you know, give Brian and the team best possible chance of you know, great success on the pitch and to give you great entertainment week in, week out. Invest in a new and sustainable pitch um, so this time the money sticks. So you know, we invest in it and we don't come back in two years' time. Really, really important. We want to continue to invest in the fan experience um, and make being at Rochdale AFC you know, the highlight of your week, the highlight of your kids' week, we want you know want them to want to come back and then nagging you when it's a when it's a wet Saturday to to, to come out. So uh, little things, but uprating some of the facilities as we can get as we can see the priorities and as we can um, trickle money through. We want to do things to make the experience better. We unashamedly we want to exploit all commercial opportunities. So you know little things like the half and half scarves and the mugs. I know we get a load of crap for it on the forum, but actually every little helps, and you know, and they do fly off the shelf. So some people actually like them. So we want to exploit, exploit the little commercial opportunities and the much bigger ones. So we do want to be a conferencing venue. We do want to be an events venue, um, so that the club isn't dark all the way through the week, uh, and there's some money coming in. Uh, and of course, you know, sponsorships as well, and. If you have the opportunity to sponsor, we've got a very active sponsor community, we've got a great business club, um, but uh, you know, if you know people who are interested, or by the way, if you know any billionaires as well, but you know, if you know, if you know people who are interested, um, please get them involved. Um, we are looking, and we, I think we've said before, we are looking for external investment. If we, if we bring external investors on board, it is likely to change the structure and the ownership of the club. And there's no way back from that once you do it. 
clubs like Wickham have you know finally realised that their you know their fan owned model wouldn't work, and, and they've just they've they've just jumped into a um, in, into an ownership model. But we want to do that with great care, because you know we are the current custodians of the 1907 legacy, and you know we do not want to hang the club out to dry so that in two years time, three years time, we have a good ride and then it all goes to pot. So really, really important if we, if we do get um, a suitor that um, they are the right for us. And we have talked to and rejected some recently um, and we continue to talk to others. Um, and of course, but if we do that, we can then invest more. And you know, one of the key projects, and we're pursuing it at the moment, and Andrew is doing a lot of work on it at the moment, is the, the training facility and a permanent home training facility that we own, and that one day we might be able to make some revenue from as well. Um, and then finally, just to provide an affordable, <coughs> we know this is Rochdale, uh, an affordable value for money football experience for all of you and for generations to come. So you'll be pleased to know um, we're nearly there. Um, so, through a lot of the sort of the facts and figures that you've seen already, you know, hopefully it's starting to, to go some way to dispel some of the myths that we see, and you know, sometimes sometimes see them in there, and they do hurt a little bit when you see them on the forums. Um, you know, where's the money gone? Um, we are not sitting on top of a big hoard of cash, uh, and you'd be surprised how quickly money just flushes out of the bank account. With great care, you know, we, we control it all, but, you know, it's just an expensive business. We're not siphoning off the money um, as, 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 as a group of directors either. We're not spending frivolous, frivolously or extravagantly. I do upset my colleagues a lot uh, on the board, I know, by when I say no, or yes, but not that much, or yes, but not now. And I did it again today. But, but, you know, it's really important that we have that check, back, check and balance, we have a conversation about it, and then, you know, and, and we get some agreement and we, uh, and we move on. So, you know, we are continuing to invest, but, you know, but, but carefully. And, you know, and the key message is, you know, the cost of running a football club properly, compliantly and safely is really, really high. And, you know, we get letters from the Football League week in, week out about, you know, the next regulation that we've got to, we've, we've got to meet. You know, there's, there's something running at the moment about the player toilets and that there aren't enough of them. You know, we're investigating the facts. I'm not sure they've got anything to go on, but, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, eventually we might get to an answer. So, you know, fi you know fi final message from me, you know, believe me, as a board, we are doing everything we can within our capabilities to run the club prudently, but to generate an exciting um, and compelling football experience for all of you and for generations to come. Because you know we don't just want a great season next season and then flat and gone. You know, we want this, to, this, this journey to run on for years and years for all of you. Um, and that, you know, that's what we're doing. And hopefully, you'll applaud that and be very happy. Okay. Over to Andrew. Thank you very much. to my presentation I'd like to ask you just for a moment to cast your thoughts back to um, and think about a colleague of mine who died Alistair Linden 
Education and Welfare Officer for 10 years. And they sadly missed. Sorry about that, it's very difficult. I've been associated with the club since the early 60s. I was an amateur player here when Tony Collins was the manager. And uh, Norman Bedell was my coach, who some of you may remember. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't good enough to play professional. I went off and played amateur football with a team called Sacred Heart. I'm currently president of Sacred Heart and we all know we're the only amateur club in this town that owns its own ground, its own facilities. I'm very proud of that. Um, I joined the board some 13, 14 years ago. I was invited in by one of the many of the overcoats, Graham Morris. Um, he's seen what we've done at Sacred Heart and asked me if I'd come along here and see if there was something I could uh, give to the club. Chris Dunphy asked me to uh, be involved in the ground and ground improvements. I told him that wasn't my bat. I was more interested in football and that I wanted to be involved in an academy. For some years they avoided doing anything about the academy and then we managed to get our hands on Tony Ellis who was a brilliant coach and uh, we took it forward from there. So. The academy has been my baby now for most of the time that I've been on the board. I did take a break for nearly 18 months and that was mainly due to the fact that uh, I didn't see eye to eye with our previous chairman and uh, one of the other board members, a guy called Goodwin. And so I left for a while. When Chris left, um, Andrew took over and he asked me to come back and continue my work with the academy. So tonight I'm just going to give you a few slides about the academy. Um, I'm going to show you a little video that, that uh, we brought, put together for uh, the benefit of the goal scorers and some of our kids who played. My assistant will know to drive it on. See <laughs> <laughs> that one?
Staffy model. I uh, apologise if it isn't readily visible from where you sat, but I'm more than happy to give copies to people if they want, if they want them. Um, it's headed up obviously by the board, Chief Exec and myself, first team manager, uh, Liam and coach, academy manager Tony Ellis, and then it works its way all the way down through pre academy elite development coaches, Mwedi P leads, FP lead coaches. Well, that's our staffing model. First team pathway since 2013, the youth and academy graduates have, have made a combined total of 756 first team appearances. Dan Edzid, Luke Matheson, Aaron Morley, Callum Camps, Andy Cannon, Jamie Allen and Connor Roman. 756 first team appearances. This slide shows opportunities that were afforded to young players starting in season 2014-15 and it shows how we play players up the, up the levels, i.e. if he's 12 we might play in the 14s, try and develop them quicker so that if, when you get to the youth team under 18s training with the first team, we've actually had in 2019-20 uh, we've had 16 players covering 152 sessions with the first team. Success stories. Since 2013, the academy graduates have made, combined, as I said, 756 first team appearances. We were actually ranked number three, sorry, number one academy for player productivity in category three, and number three in the whole country. That source was from the Premier League. Current and past players have progressed to be sold when it's both suits the club and the player. Current and past players have got international caps, which is very unusual for a club our size. Ex-player progressions, we've got many who go on to other clubs or academies, colleges, universities at home and full paid university scholarships abroad with a select few progressing on to national organisations like the LFE, Football Association and International Organisation. Ex-players transition into Rochdale FC Academy coaches. So, under 18s have come to first team and side professional. Jamie Allen, Scott Tanza, Joel Logan, Dan Arcee O'Connor, Callum Camps, Andy Cannon, Johnny Sanger, James Hooper, Billy Clegg, and Niall Bell. Added to that, we've got Matty Gillen, Aaron Morley, Brian Wade, Dan Hedzhead, Lewis Bradley, Fabio Tavares, Harrison Hopper, Luke Matheson, and most recently, Keaton Mulvey, who's coming from one of our uh, development squads. Other graduates that we've had, Will Buckley, he was signed from college, in 2006, 17 year old. Um, he's now played for Watford, Brighton, Sunderland, and Bolton. Ronald Craig, released at uh, under 16 as a central midfielder, re signed at 18 for Bradford Perra, since played for West Brom and Watford. Scotty Hogan, again, he was released at under 18. <laughs> Played for a number of clubs, returned to us in uh, tw uh, 21, and he's since played for uh, Brentford and Aston Villa, plus various loans that he's come out on. On further education, we've got a, great, a wonderful record on further education. If you look at that slide, we've got, we've got lads who've gone on to uh, universities in, in uh, America. We've got players who are playing in Sweden. Um, Basically what we do with the academy is we, we're not just a football academy, we've got to continue with the 
with uh, education and that proves the point and a reason why a lot of people will send their kids to us is that we don't just bounce them into football, we help them with their education as well. We've had boys who unfortunately have left us and signed professional contracts elsewhere and the main reason for that is we, we've got a limited capacity in how many we can retain when they get to 18. In an ideal world we have a continuation of their education and football ability up to a higher age but we just as a club as you've seen from the accounts we just can't afford that. There are lads who've gone on from here and, and joined uh, and signed professional contracts with Cheltenham Fleetwood Town and various other clubs. The academy has uh, progression pathways. We've got the academy in the middle, we've got our development centres at Edge Hill, in Bolton, in Hyde, and at Rochdale and Withenshaw. And we've got the under 17, 18 developments, plus education in Hyde and in Rochdale. And the academy itself deals with under 9 to under 18 and then into the first team and the pathways go in both ways. And so, you know, we're con constantly monitoring how they perform and how they're progressing. And hopefully the objective is to get a professional footballer to play in the first team. So, the benefits to the club. An academy product who plays goes on to play professional at Rochdale until the age of 22, would have saved the club in the region of £200,000 per player in wages. That's a saving of around a million pounds since 2013. Further savings are still in progress. And Rochdale AFC Academy products have produced the club in the region of 3.2 million plus add-ons. And in six years, seven years, I think that's a, a wonderful achievement. Uh, hopefully it will continue. <laughs> and I'll hand on to Francis. Everybody. I'm Francis Fielding, I'm Director of Sales and Marketing at the club. Hopefully most of you will know of me by now because I've been at the club for five years. But I just wanted to give you a little bit more information about myself, my role at the club and our plans for the commercial department moving forwards. So prior to joining the club, I worked at Rochdale Council. I spent 10 years working in economic development and my degree is in business and marketing. I was invited to join the board back in December 2018, so I've been on the board for just over 18 months now, but I was invited to sit on the board as a member of staff. So I haven't paid for a seat on the board and I don't have any voting rights, but I'm invited to attend the monthly board meetings so I can put forward ideas, proposals, and most importantly, keep the directors updated on the day-to-day -day commercial activities at the club. I'm extremely proud to have been invited to join the board. My family have been supporting Rochdale Football Club for over 30 years now, and I have a young family myself. My son, Freddie, he's nine years old. He's a massive Rochdale fan. So I hope that I'm able to bring a younger they won't like me for saying that, <laughs> a younger and um, family-focused view to the board, as well as keeping them updated on the commercial activities, but also a female voice. <laughs> so in terms of my role as sales and marketing director, it's probably 90% sales and 10% marketing. And that's because we are a very small team behind the scenes. So I have to spend as much of my time as possible to bring in as much money into the club that I can. And I do that through various ways. So the main area is through sponsorships. So I'm responsible for the sponsorship income in the club and I get a lot of support with David on this. So that might be kit sponsorship, so front of shirt, back of shirt, shorts, sleeve, um, stadium sponsorship, player sponsorship, match sponsorships. And we're always trying to think of new and innovative sponsorship ideas. 
We also bring in advertising income into the club. So that could be perimeter board advertising when we have the cup games, digital uh, LED advertising, stadium advertising, programme advertising. And we see more of a trend from businesses wanting digital advertising. I'm also responsible for all the hospitality sales on a match day in the club. And I'm extremely proud of this as well, because I think over the last few years, we've really improved our hospitality offer. And if you haven't experienced it, if you are a season ticket holder, you can upgrade and it's only £30. And um, I also line manage um, the ticket office manager, the retail manager, the lotteries manager. And we've just had a, a member of staff move positions and she's now going to be working as our events coordinator part time. So she has now come into the commercial team as well. In terms of the marketing side of my job, um, I manage the media manager. We have two members of staff, Greg Jones and Adam Clapham. And between the three of us, we're responsible for all the marketing, advertising and promotions of Rochdale Football Club. So I've just put up a, a structure diagram so you can see really how small the team is. So myself, um, I report on a daily basis to David our chief executive, and I would just like to say that in my five years at working in the club, David has been the best chief executive that I've been able to work with. And um, we, in turn, report directly to the board of directors, again, who give us a tremendous amount of support on a day-to-day -day basis. So, reporting to myself, um, the de departmental teams, Greg Jones, our media manager, John Marsh, our ticket office manager, David Smith-Markle, our retail manager, Ray Parry, our lotteries manager, and Karen Appleton, our events coordinator. And that's your commercial team. So in terms of sponsors, um, we have six major sponsors with the club. Crown Oil are obviously our main sponsor. They sponsor our front of shirt and the stadium. And they have one more season to run with their current sponsorship agreement. But we're already well underway in appointing a sponsor for the 2021-22 season onwards. And in fact, David and myself took a proposal to the board this afternoon. Andrew Kelly Lettins are our back of shirt sponsor. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, Araya are obviously our kit supplier. Reside sponsor our away stand. Smith Metals sponsor our family stand. And Howard Timber and Building Supplies are our longest standing consecutive sponsor at the club. So if we were Manchester United, they'd have one member of staff employed to look after each one of those key accounts. But we're not Manchester United, so there is just myself. But in addition, sorry, I look after all the other sponsors in the club and during a season we'll have anywhere between 100 to 150 sponsors. So I've just put 30 sponsors up on the slide here so you can see the types of businesses that we work with. And we're very lucky to have some fantastic businesses who sponsor the club and come back year after year. So Gem Pumps in the top corner, they're a local company. They sponsor a match every year, they sponsor a player. And they're really proud of the fact that they've got the um, biggest bar tab on a match day. Crep <laughs> <laughs> um, Protect in the middle. Um, we're really pleased again, they're a brand new sponsor that we've secured. And they're a global company, they provide... Um, trainer and cleaning products for trainers and football boots um, they sponsored our sleeve for the Newcastle game and they're sponsoring our shorts for the remainder of the season they're really keen to do more with us so we're hopeful that they may potentially become a major sponsor going forwards just a couple of others um, RRG Toyota they've been another long-standing sponsor to the club they this season sponsored our dugouts, um, Alpens Travel. We've just announced that they're going to be our travel sponsor for next season. And we're just going to announce very soon that Kia Motors are going to be sponsoring our media for the remainder of this season. So hopefully you can see the different types of sponsorship packages that we're always trying to come up with. I just wanted to touch a little bit on marketing and, and it would be extremely easy to do my job if I had a big marketing budget. But the reality is I don't and I literally work on a shoestring budget. And that's because we have to be careful of every single penny that we spend at this football club. And there's so much that I'd love to do. And it's challenging because I have a very minimal budget. So a lot of the times I'm going to advertisers, can I book this advertisement? But 
can I pay you in tickets? So it's, it's another challenge to the job. But I'm very passionate about marketing. Um, and it was one of the first things that I wanted to do when I came into the club. Um, because in all honesty, there wasn't a lot of marketing that was being done. Um, there was the odd person doing a bit here and a little bit there. But nothing was joined up. So one of the first things that I did was introduce a set of brand guidelines that was adopted throughout the club so that everything that was going out had the same look and feel so that we could build on the strong brand identity that is Rochdale Football Club and I also produced a marketing strategy. So I just wanted to touch on quickly a typical marketing plan because I know that comes up a lot as well on the forums what are we doing to market the football club so hopefully you'll recognise this campaign which we ran to launch the start of the season, the new dawn beckons. And this is typically the types of things that we'd be doing. At the moment, we're working behind the scenes on producing our season ticket campaign. So a lot of what we do is done across our digital media platforms. And that's because it's a very minimal cost to us. Um, and across all of those platforms, we average around 5 million impressions a month. So it's a huge platform for us to use and get the information out there. And I've put Rochdale Online up there as well, which I can see Claire is in the audience. We also produce a weekly e-newsletter, which goes out via email. This has been a challenge as well, because when GDPR was introduced, um, everybody had to opt in to receive the newsletter. And of course, a lot of people didn't, so we lost a lot of subscribers, but we are building that back up. And we send that out every Friday. We also put, uh, use a lot of printed materials. So we do things with the Rochdale Observer, local publications like Rochdale Style Magazine, Real Rochdale, Hayward Handbook. And we do our own leaflet distribution. So our day of lotto, uh, we produce a result sheet every week that goes out to 5,000 homes and businesses across Rochdale Borough. So we regularly advertise the football club on the back of that. We do a lot of radio advertising. We work very closely with Revolution Radio. And this season, we've started working with Crescent Radio, which is an Asian radio station. And we've also just started doing, doing some work with Hits Radio of Manchester. We obviously do the outdoor advertising, which is brilliant. And that's booked in for the uh, season ticket campaign. We do direct mail and we get involved in, in large scale community events. So at the moment, Dippy the Dinosaur is in town. So we're talking to the council about how we can get involved, take players down to that. And we do school visits, we'll go to supermarkets, shopping centres, sports centres, wherever there's a large public footfall, we'll, we'll go out there promoting the club. <coughs> Um, I can't give enough credit to our media team, um, Greg and Adam, for all the work that they do because they literally work around the clock to get content out for you. And there is just the two of them in the team. Leanne Ball is on maternity leave. She will be coming back next season and rejoining us. But um, the stuff that they're doing, they cover all the pre and post match reporting, all the match reports, not just for the first team, but the youth team as well. Um, they put together a match preview before every game and there's so much content in there. They put the highlights out, they conduct all the player interviews, the manager interviews, all the content on the website and our social media channels. Um, they put all the content on iFollow. They're also covering the community, the academy, they liaise with our media partners. And we also have, he's in the room, stood at the back, an award-winning match day programme, which um, our editor, Mark Wilbraham, is here, and that's something the club is extremely proud of. Um, <clears throat> as David had said, our junior supporters of the future for this football club, so we are focused on attracting junior fans. So, as well as introducing the £10 season ticket, some other initiatives that we've done that you might not be aware of, we invested in Desmond's Den this season, which is a space in the family stand in the Carlsberg Lounge where we've got playstations for the kids. and um, We've got an area where we hold uh, workshops, arts and crafts activities. Um, so that's every Saturday home game. It's just a space for the children to go and to use. Um, we produce two junior newsletters every season. So all our junior season ticket holders receive that in the post, along with a Christmas card, birthday card, 
Um, with Dale in the community, we're going out into the schools, doing player visits. For the Gillingham game, we did a junior takeover where the kids took over the running of the football club, which was brilliant, and we're going to be doing that, more things like that. We've got strong links now with our grassroots football teams across the borough, um, thanks to the flag-bearing initiatives that we've been running. We do a school's cup tournament on the pitch every year, and um, obviously you will have seen that the new kick pitch is being built, and I believe that's due to open on the 13th of April. I just wanted to quickly touch on the other commercial departments and update you. Um, as Tony's already said, we're going to be introducing a season ticket card next season and, and Tony's driven much of the work on this. Um, so gone will be your season ticket books with the tear out stubs that all have to be manually counted by Karen and Jill on a match day. Um, so you'll be given a, a card which will have a, a QR code on and you will use that to scan entry into the stadium. We um, will also be making it easier to make online ticket sales. So at the moment, if you buy a ticket online, you still have to come to the ticket office to queue up to collect your ticket. You won't have to do that. You buy a ticket online on, you, on your phone, it'll email you a QR code and you can scan in through the turnstile with your mobile phone. You can, of course, still buy a ticket from the ticket office, if you're not that techie, but it'll have a QR code on it and you will use that to scan entry into the stadium. Um, hopefully, you will also be able to purchase hospitality tickets online. At the moment, it can only done, be done through myself, so we're just trying to make it easier to buy. Um, we will be moving to cashless turnstiles. Again, you will be able to pay cash for a ticket on the day, but you will have to buy that from the ticket office. Uh, and obviously the automated entry. In terms of retail, if you've been in our club shop lately, you will have seen that we've had a big refurbishment in there, and we're also developing a new online store for 2020. Um, Tony mentioned as well, we've changed the opening hours in the club shop to align with our business. Um, and we always try and involve the fans in our kits every year and um, Mark sat in the audience and he actually won the trip to Italy last year so he got to see how the kits was being made so we did um we did a we're bringing back a retro shirt this season a retro way shirt which you've voted for and we'll be revealing that on our kit launch and family fun day which will be Saturday the 20th of June. Dale Lotto um, I'm pleased to announce that for the first time in a long time, our lottery is beginning to show signs of growth. Um, it's been very difficult with the lottery because historically it's been in decline, average around 5% year on year, and that was even before I joined the club. And that's no reflection on the hard work of the staff and the agents involved, it's just the way that lotteries have changed. So it's been tough and we've had to make decisions. but. If we didn't make these changes, in all honesty, we wouldn't have had a lottery. So we've rebranded it. It's now Dale Lotto. We've introduced a £2 lottery subscription. And we're trying to move people onto direct debits and standing order. So it's reducing the number of missed collections. We've introduced scratch cards, which we've sold some tonight. Um, we've introduced a new half-time draw, which again has been challenging but it's now stabilising the introduction of the second prize. The shirt off my back has been really popular. Um, and we're going to be holding our first Dale Lotto event. We've not had a chance to inform the trust yet, so they might be annoyed at me. But we're going to be doing a Karina quiz night, and Brian's going to come along, and that'll be here on Thursday the 26th of March. So it'll be £10 for Dale Lotto members, £12 for non-members. Uh, We've also undercut your hair as well on the pricey, so I apologise about that. <laughs> um, and lastly, of course, all funds raised from our lottery directly contribute to the running costs of our academy. Final slide, um, I just wanted to touch on a few more things, and hopefully you will have noticed that we've now introduced a fan gallery um, after every game, which is on the website, capturing all the fans' reactions. That's down to Stephen Ritty. I think oh, he's down here. He's been taking snaps all evening. 
Um, Stephen's been doing it voluntarily and he's been doing an amazing job and he's been a fantastic addition to the scene. We can't thank you enough, honestly. Um, I follow. We're now able to live stream Tuesday night games on I follow and the Portsmouth game next Friday will also be available on I follow. So you can purchase a match pass and watch the game in your front room for £10 or an audio pass for £2.50 and listen to the Calment trip. And again, massive thanks to Martin Culshaw um, and Paul Hudson, who do such a passionate and amazing job of doing our match day commentary. So thanks to you guys. Um, in terms of digital, we are moving with digital times. We've just started doing bits of online um, targeted advertising. We've been speaking to vloggers because all the kids are watching these vloggers on YouTube, talking about inviting them to come to the games and cover the games. We've also been speaking to Revolution Radio about producing podcasts. Um, it's been spoke about already, but we want to make the Crown Oil Arena a first class conference and events hub within Rochdale Borough. And with the closure of the Town Hall, there's a big opportunity there to capitalise on lots of room bookings, weddings, events. We have a very successful business club. Our next event is going to be held prior to the Wimbledon Games. If anybody, any business is in the room, if you'd like to <coughs> attend that, please let me know. We're always trying to target new sponsors. Um, we're just going to be announcing very shortly, we've invested some graphics in our tunnel, the players' tunnel, so you'll be able to buy a tunnel experience um, for £25. We're going to be planning a big, uh, large-scale community event on bonfire night. Um, we're planning on holding fireworks. We're going to get fairground rides, food operators on the car park and hope that it's an event for everybody in Rochdale to come down and enjoy. And we will very soon be announcing pre-season training uh, packages for fans to Portugal. So that's everything from me. I'll hand back over to Dave. Thanks, Francis, and thank you to the top table. Thank you to the top table for some brilliant presentations. I've certainly never seen anything like that in all my time here. They've been very informative. You can see just how far forward Rochdale Football Club really is moving. And I'm sure you've all learnt a lot as well. And I'm sure there's a lot of your questions been answered. Uh, we are going to go around the room now if anybody's got any questions for any of the top table. Uh, obviously, it is really, really busy tonight. So I'm going to start at this side and work the way around to that side. So we're not going to be running back and forth. So if you've got any questions to ask, now is your time to do it. We're going to start this side, work our way around to that side. And before you ask a question, please do give your name so that our top table know exactly who they're speaking to. So like I say, we're going to start this side and work our way around. Any questions from anywhere along the bar for our top table? Like I say, the gentleman over there. Hi, uh, my name's Steve Murray. Um, the question I have is, uh, it was alluded to during the presentation, um, who liaises with the manager? Um, is it a shared liaison or is it one person? How often does it, does it happen? Is there a weekly uh, reg or a regular meeting arranged? Um, or is it an as and when event? Uh, if you didn't get that, this is Steve Murray. Uh, he wants to know who liaises with the manager how many of you liaise with the manager and how often you liaise with the manager? Steve, to give you the answer to that, um, I have weekly meetings with Brian, Lee Riley, Kevin Gibbons and Callum um, Jones' assistant. Um, we meet down at the training ground or we meet here. I provide a, a report to the board and Brian also presents at a monthly board meeting. Brian's been in today for about an hour in the board meeting, so that's how the club is structured. Okay. Does that differ from when Keith Hill was manager? Uh, no, um, in my short time as chief exec when Keith was here, I had exactly the same meetings with Keith um, as I've got with Brian. Uh, anyone else on this side of the room? Like I say, we are only going to sweep the room once, and so now is your chance to ask any questions. The gentleman over there. I hate to say this, but I'm called David Bottomley. <laughs> Don't scratch the car. Um, poor me, thank you. Um, I've got a, a bit of an issue that probably won't be very popular with majority of football fans, and it's to do with language on the terraces. Now, I know that will always be there, and I, I was probably one who was always there and 
showed him me bits and bats. Now the problem is you're trying to encourage children. I take week in and week off, I take my seven year old lad with me. And when we're sat on the edge of the, seg the so called segregation area, the language is horrendous. And I've got to explain that to him. It's actually more notable at away matches because we're obviously more passionate. And I understand that. But can the club, or is there anything in the future where segregation can somehow be beneficial to families? Or um, I, I've even had it in the bar. I mean, we just do not go in the bar anymore. So it's, it's David, just you're where we right. go with that. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about that this year. Um, we have a weekly game planning meeting, and I played to the game planning meeting last week some video that had been shot in our Carlsberg Lounge where the language in extreme close proximity to juniors in Desmond's Den was absolutely appalling. You wouldn't, um, you know, you'd walk away and it was terrible. And we want to rid the club of that in the nicest possible way that people will always swear. We get that. It's football. But we are going to work much harder next year in the Smith Metal stand to create a much bigger family zone, to create a family area. From our point of view, to secure that better for families so they feel um, they can go in there. We've picked up a very good idea from a number of other clubs, which is where they have a, a mobile phone you can text. So you can text without drawing attention uh, of yourself to a steward. So you can text them um, in um, row 14, seat G, or whatever, or row G, seat 14, and there are people swearing around me, and stewards will intervene. Doncaster do that very successfully, so do a lot of clubs. It's fair to say that Karen Cholton uh, and Jill Pressman, who are our away coaching stewards, tell me that they've noticed an increase, as do a lot of people, a notice of increased in swearing at away matches from Rochdale fans this year, uh, and also, very sadly, an increase in racism. Now, we also meet at the club with the safety advisory group, which is the police, and the police tell us that the uh, situation with swearing and racism is now worse in football than it was in the 1970s. And I think it's uh, incumbent upon all of us to try and stop that because, um, you know, we all swear from time to time. Just in answer to the last question, the meetings with Brian that I have are much different than the meetings with Keith because Brian, in fairness, never swears. And I think that's a wonderful image to portray, whereas Keith was a bit more industrial in his uh, use of language. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But it, it's right that we should, we want to create an environment where people can enjoy it and that you should feel safe bringing your seven, eight, nine-year-old, ten-year-old child to this ground and not having to explain certain comments. Somebody asked, you know, a seven-year-old asked his father at a Tramway game at the start of the season, a comment that a Rochdale fan had made, and you'd find it very difficult to explain. So, in a long answer to your question, we do want to get rid of it. We're very committed to getting rid of it, and we will act on it next season, but we will we'll provide a much better family environment in the Smith Metal stand. Thank you. Uh, okay, anyone else on this side of the room? Like I so say, we are only going to sweep it once because it's so busy. Gentlemen at the back. Can you name your question, please? Uh, name's Paul Moran, a season ticket holder in the main stand. And it's more of a suggestion than a question, to be, to be quite honest with you. Uh, going on from what uh, has been said about um, the, uh, the club shop and also the new ticketing um, arrangements that should come into place. So I just wonder if the board have ever explored uh, the possibility, and it's going to cost money, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you now, <laughs> initially, of potentially opening an outlet in the town centre, uh, perhaps in somewhere like the Wheat Chief Centre. Um, the reason being, it's, it's it, as, as a second club shop, partly, and also as a second way of getting tickets out, and potentially lottery, out to fans who wouldn't necessarily throw up here. Um, I believe the council are desperate for trainers to go into the week chief. You could well get a good deal out of them. I was just wondering if it's something that you've thought about. Uh, everybody's looking at me and saying you answer it. Last time I answered all the questions at the forum, I got in trouble. Um, so but please forgive me. I 100% agree with you. And I personally have brought it to the board and myself and Francis have had healthy... Um, conversations over the last 12 months about the rights and wrongs of it. I firmly believe we should be selling tickets where people go. And if we could find the deal and we could staff it, we would actually do that. Because you, you, I would like to have a presence on a Saturday morning that convinces people who don't come anywhere near the ground to buy tickets and come to watch Rochdale on a Saturday. 
The problem is, even though you say they're looking for cheap deals, cheap deals are actually quite expensive. And an ideal world would find a benefactor that gives a pop-up shop for three months at Christmas and a pop-up shop every Saturday so we could sell tickets. But I, I agree with you, and yes, it's part of our long-term thinking. Thank you. Okay, we've got a gentleman at the front going to ask a question. Can you name a question, please, sir? Yeah, my name's very calmly, and I've looked at the accounts for the year ended 2019, and we made a loss of 1.2 million, I should have worked, sorry, 1 point, yeah, 1.2 million, yeah. and a million pounds of that was in transfer fees. Could you tell us whose transfer fee, if you've got the details, of who, who actually contributed that money? Transfer fees we paid? No, no. received Receive one million. Yeah, so four four fifty of it was Scott Hogan second Scott Hogan's secondary deal. Sort of add-ons as a So that was an add that was an add-on. That was an add-on. Um Yeah, McGarvey Ad said no Ad said is next to Canon. Can, can, yeah. So so yeah, so there were there were a num number of components that come together for, for that, but some of it's secondary. Yeah. In the balance sheet, sorry, in the balance sheet, it's shown as a debtor, D, uh, Roch, D Nurse Park, Rochdale Limited. Right. Mm -hmm. And how come we can have 450,000 to the debt that we're never going to get repaid on? Well, which you know, now stands I know, at 1.6 million. Yeah, so Dean Hurst Park mm -hmm. is the stadium company. Yeah. So we own Dean Hurst Park. Well, well, and that, when I alluded to it earlier, so there was some unusual accounting going on between between Deanhurst Park and the football club. Now actually it consolidates and it, dis and it kind of disappears, so which is part of the reason why we're doing consolidated accounts. Why but are we, Why are we paying then £99,000 rent? Correct, that's why? the problem. That's the problem because historically it was set up that the club only paid Deanhurst Park a small amount for its football. Funnily enough, it costs a lot to run a stadium and provide a pitch and all the, all, you know, all the groundsman services, etc., etc. So the club was never paying its fair share for use of the facility. Now, in a way, it kind of doesn't matter when you consolidate everything out. It does, because you're, you're accumulating a debt that you're never going to get paid. Well, we, we own that debt. And we do, we, no, we, we, own, we own the debt because we own Deanhurst Park. You may own Deanhurst Park, but why can you spend 450000 during the last year, then what on? The, there is there's consistently money going across into Deanhurst Park for use of the facilities. It's not enough, so we're loaning Deanhurst Park money to be able to pay its way, and that loan is building up and building up. So it looks like a big debt. You're right; it'll never get paid, and actually, at some point, we'll just cancel it out. So we'll, 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 we'll deal with the treatment. It is bonkers, you're right, and it's historic. Which is, but that's why we decided to bring both sets of accounts together and show the whole picture. So you can then see the cost of running the club. Now, it was confused before as well because Deanhurst Park once was owned by the council, the rugby club, and ourselves, three ways. Now, whether whether the arrange, the intercompany arrangements then were better and it worked, I don't know. I mean, it's lost in the mists of time. Um, but that's the reason we have that. We have that company. But we also owe Rockshaw Council about four hundred thousand pounds as well, don't we? For for the DSP. correct, correct. So there's a, there's still a loan outstanding yes. for, um, for, for for when we bought the club, when we bought the when we bought the ground, we, and we're paying that off on a on a on a. 60k a year, and there is some interest in, uh, associated with that. And if we ever have a big windfall, we'll probably pay that off early, probably. Um, but it's not costing us a huge amount of money, and given its cash flow business, we, we, you know, we don't have the cash in the bank to be able to pay it off. But is it not true to say then we're not paying a fair rent for the spot on pitch at 99,000? Correct. Correct, but it doesn't. But it, but it doesn't. But it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Yes, because it's consolidated, it doesn't. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter. But but you're right. Historically, it looked very very strange. And historically, when you only publish one side of the story and one set of accounts, it did look very strange. 
because it was painting a, a, a rosier picture than the, 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 than the truth. Which is why we took a decision two years ago. We, we kicked it around the board to decide whether it was the right thing to do. We took a decision to publish the whole truth through a consolidated set. There you go, and I think Mr Putney's answered the question. If anyone does want to go into further detail with that, I'm sure Mr Putney will be available to talk to any of the fans. Th thank you for the question. I mean, it is, it, it is important and it is a historical oddity. Thank you. Okay, any more questions from this side of the room, gentlemen here? Can I have your name and question, please? <coughs> Ian Tweedale, is there any chance that the board might tell us or give us any idea of the sale of Luke Matheson, i.e. did we get a million plus add-ons or did we get a million without add-ons? Is there any chance that we might hear a bit more of that story? <laughs> Yeah, you guessed it. I'll tell you what, it wasn't 10 million. And, and um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't have approaches from Man United and Man City. They weren't scrapping in the foyer to, to try and buy him. Um, so, and it was a tough decision to make, I, I have to tell you. It, it took a while. Um, there will be more, it'll be wrapped into the next set of accounts. You'll see some of the headlines, but, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be a mixture of money now and add-ons in the future. I think we've answered the question as much as we can there on that one. Uh, any more questions over this side of the room? Ken Davis, can you just uh, bring me up to date? I'm thinking in consideration of the, the pitch in particular, which you've gone into quite in depth tonight. What's now the relationship, the current relationship with the Rochdale Football Club and all its and the Rugby League? How is it going to affect things over the next couple of seasons, David? Um, being brutally honest, the relationship now between the football club and Rochdale Hornets is probably at an all-time high. Um, we have a very high regard for Steve Kerr, the chief executive of Rochdale Hornets, and we have a lot of respect for the people who are now coming into Hornets to try and put money in. Um, the board, very when the decision um, in the end, the negotiation to buy the ground back from the Rugby Football League that owned the share, in the ground and, Ro and Rochdale Council, we would have never been able to do the deal to buy the stadium back for the football club if a huge rent had been imposed on Rochdale Hornets. That, that, would have been a, that was a non-starter. I was on the board at the time that the negotiations were finalised. And in fairness to people who aren't here, they were finalised because we gave a very low rent. So we know where Hornets are, but Hornets now have a desire to improve where they are, put money into the team, um, provide attractive rugby league and get themselves back up the rugby league pyramid. The, the people who are investing in the club have expressed a desire to actually help with further, on top of the rent, uh, stadium maintenance costs. They actually want to invest in this lounge. They'd like to partner us. So you have to believe that. Um, commercially, they're not paying the rent that is equivalent to where they should be. I know what they paid to rent the AJ Bell Stadium yesterday. But I, I also have to say, in defence of Rochdale Hornets, they took that decision on Monday of last week to do that. They were under no obligation to actually do that. And I have to tell you also that a rugby league referee would have passed the pitch fit to play yesterday. And the fact that Rochdale Hornets played away from this stadium at their own expense ensures that, yes, we're ex investing in covers this week to get the game on, but we'll get the game on on Saturday on a very playable pitch. And had Hornets played here yesterday, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, they've also cancelled other games. And also, I'll be honest, it's in the details of our uh, lease agreement with Rochdale Hornets. Never in the lease agreement is a period of time that we've actually requested this year from the 4th of May through to the 1st of August. And we say the 1st of August because that's the opening day of the next EFL season. It may be that we actually don't play till the 8th. That's not in the lease, and Hornets have been very, very understanding of that because they realise that if they don't have a service to play on, they don't play rugby league. So the relationship is the best it's ever been. I do have to say that in my five years on the board, it's the best. Thanks, Ken. OK, we've got a question on the front of Dave Chaffer. Um, given the ticketing methods are going to be changing, are we going to see an increase in season ticket prices for next season? It's not actually, because we're putting the, the new system in, 
doesn't necessarily mean we're going to increase the prices. We are starting to have a look at our pricing strategy for next year, but it's in very early stages. What I can say is um, you know, season tickets aren't for everyone. Um, you know, we have very generous um, season ticket prices at the moment. You wouldn't be surprised if you know, there, there, there might be a, a, a small increase there. But what we want to be able to do is introduce a membership scheme as well. We're looking at the structure of that where you would pay a fee for a, car, a membership card up front. You'd be, then get discounted rates for, uh, for each game which you'd load onto your cards. And you'd also get a load of extra um, benefits and rewards as a, as a result of that. So we're looking at creatively about you know, how can we um, change the profile of our ticketing to encourage people to become members so that we can you know, track and communicate with them and offer them more promotions and maybe encourage them to come back more often um, and make it a little bit more affordable for people who you know, struggle to make the decision to, make a, to get a, a season ticket but to come more often to the games. We'll of course have the you know, walk-ups as well but you know, we'll be encouraging people to, to, to register. So, you know, we, it, it's under review. As you saw in the presentation, you know, only 13% of the revenue you required came from ticketing. We do need to find a way to increase that. What I'd love to do, though, is do that you know, without too much penalty on, you know, on the ticket prices and more about more fans on seats. And so if we can get more fans, more families, and then you know, more purchases when they're with us, um, you know, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. For gentlemen, here, could you name a question, please? David Lee, season ticket holder and shareholder. In your presentation, Tony, you said two new pitches laid in two years, 2017-2018. Um, Both pitches laid down by the same supplier. No guarantees in place. Now, how on earth could that happen? And the second thing is, how much is this new pitch going to cost with the 10-year guarantee? I'll answer that question because um, myself, Graham Rawlinson, Andrew Kelly and John Small were on the board when the last two pitches were installed. Um, I can say things that are fact in this forum. The fact is the two pitches that were acquired were never voted on by the board. They were just installed. So the fact that there was no guarantee with them came as no surprise. Um, the board this time has worked very, very hard with major suppliers to get to a situation where the investment we're making is with a major contractor, the company that we're actually going to be going with, uh, named Manchester United. Their pitch is seven years old, and United have got a seven-year guarantee on the pitch. Sorry, a ten-year guarantee. Uh, the amount of money we're spending inevitably does invoke getting a guarantee, and the current board wouldn't have deemed to undertake a pitch renovation and the massive work we're having done on the drainage without some form of guarantee. Fine, that's great, Matt. So now tell me how much it's going to cost, and um, tell me how much it's going to cost. And it's a good job we've got a new chairman. Thank God for you, because if we hadn't had for you, God knows what you would have done. You're shareholders, for God's sake. You know, you, know you, you, you should have known about this situation. Somebody comes along and says, oh, we'll just lay a pitch. All the way a pitch, this year and next year. Don't matter if it costs 50,000 quid. We'll just do it. Now, come on, you're responsible to us. Tell me, how much is this new pitch going to cost with its 10-year guarantee? Please. No. Why? Because I don't want to answer that question directly tonight. It's costing a huge amount of money. I stated in my presentation that Accrington spent 400000 this summer, so you'll get some idea of how much money we're spending in the summer of 2020. Okay, thank you. I think we've gone as far as we can, can with the pitch. Just, just one last question. You what's your name, please, sir? My name's Mark. This is Mark. Season ticket holder in the main stand. I'd just like to say, we own the ground, lock, stock and barrel, and we own all the bars, correct? Correct. So, why after games is much of the ground shut off? When the Dale Bar used to be after the game, long periods, it's well supported when there's various events on. So after the game, you always had a hard call, especially the Dale Bar, maybe 100 and odd lads. After the game, if it's a busy match to get Sunderland, clearing off, about an hour and 15, people very understanding about other events later on in the evening. But you've got 
everything that you paid for, lock, stock and barrel, and you only own one bar after the game for most occasions, and there's one man and his dog in there. So, and that's studs, as I call it. But why aren't you utilising what you paid for? Have you franchised it, or what, what have you done? Utilise what you've got. There's a lot of people that like using various bars after the game. A lot of revenue lost. That's all I want to say. What Mark's just asked the people around the corner that haven't heard is why are more of the bars, why is more of the ground not open after a match on match days? Sorry about that, it was technology. The simple answer is that there are two bars open after the game. One, of course, is the Carlsberg Lounge, the other is the 1907. We cannot open the, the Dale Bar at every game. We do occasionally open it if we believe there's going to be enough attendees, enough uh, customers. If there were 100 people that every, wanted to get in after every game, we'd have it open, I can assure you. We have vi video evidence of who comes in. There are times it cannot be opened for just strategic running reasons. We use the Dill Bar um, when we have functions late in the evening as uh, assembly food assembly points. Um, when we believe there will be enough customers, we do open it. Thank you. Okay, obviously we've got a lot of people in tonight and not a lot of time, so we're going to head over to this side of the room now. Is there any questions from this end of the room for the board? Can we name a question, please? Uh, George Brigham, thank you very much so far for the transparent uh, presentation you've all given. It's very much appreciated. Francis, Tony, newcomers, uh, thank you so much. It was really, really good. And the passion was fantastic. <coughs> Earlier on, David, you mentioned about the service in the 112 years of the club. Um, I want to know if the board have any permanent recognition plans for former chairman, especially those you can get the name right of. And if not, why not? If you didn't get that question, the question of this gentleman was, is there any plans of any recognition for former chairman of the club from the club's history? Um, if I can answer that, Quite often, when a director leaves the club, uh, they're offered the role of vice president. Um, I think if you're alluding to our former chairman, he was offered to be a vice president. He turned it down. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman said, we're not just about the last chairman, previous chairman as well. Mr. Kilpatrick you're talking about. Mr. Kilpatrick is the Vice President and he does attend the games. Mr. Kilpatrick is the Vice President and he's still with the club. And is there any more questions from this end of the table? Obviously we are running out of time unfortunately. A lot of people here tonight. We'll take two or three more questions. So if anyone has got a question to ask the board at top table, now is your chances. One gentleman at the back and we'll take that gentleman over there. Name a question please. Nigel McDonald, uh, season ticket holder in the Sandy Lane. Um, just to go back to the, the pitch, um, I'm pleased that it's now a, a board decision to move forward with the replacement of the pitch, but I didn't hear any mention of the ground staff actually being involved in the advice process. Is that, were they involved? Did they give their technical uh, knowledge? And were they asked for the, their technical advice? And also, what depth are we going to actually go down to this time? Because I think in previous uh, strips of the pitch, we've only gone down, say, 100, 150 millimetres. And the compaction from having fought that pitch many, many a time, it's a lot lower than that. Well, I, I could call Richard Blackburn up, our head groundsman, uh, to talk about this. Richard has been not only involved in the cons consultation process with all the major pitch contractors we've had in. He's actually held in incredible high esteem by those pitch contractors um, for the very reason they know what an incredible job that um, Richard, Josh Haig have done on our pitch this year to get it to a situation where Saturday was the first postponement we've had because to be honest, it's actually a miracle. 
Uh, Richard could probably answer that question about depth, but um, we're going down probably about 15 feet, as I understand it, <laughs> digging under the stand. We're going to go back to literally where it was in 1907. Um, back to where we very started. Every single drain that's there now is going to be stripped out and a whole new drainage system is going to be put in because the basic problem with uh, pitches is the drainage is at fault. Oldham's pitch that I watched on the game on Saturday is 16 years old and so they've got a pitch that's lasted 16 years and the reason they have that is that at the end of the game you only know it had rained. So there you go. Is, we've got Rick and Josh at our groundsman at the back now. Is there anything you want to add to that, lads? Or are you happy with what Mr. Bottom would just said? <laughs> yeah, and I think your question's answered there. The fact that our ground staff have heavily been involved with the new pitch as well. OK, we've got a gentleman over here for a question somewhere. <coughs> Name a question, please. Peter Howard. Uh, does anybody know what the position is with Ian Henderson and getting him to extend his contract. Uh, the question there was, does anyone know what's happening with Ian Henderson and his contract? <laughs> Thanks very much. Today. My daughter's just left the room, she's written a lot of questions. Uh, I think... Um, from, from, from my perspective, I get a genuine feeling from both sides that um, there's every possibility and hope that something will get done. Um, I think that's been the case throughout the season, really. Um, I think I think the one slight variable that counts against us all is um, probably the outside factor of what Ian can attract somewhere else. Um, but I know from speaking to him that his, his preference is uh, to stay here. And I know from speaking to um, all the guys here that they want him to stay and I want him to stay. I'm sure everybody here wants him to stay, but there is always that slight um, uncontrollable aspect to these situations. Um, I don't think it can, could really be helped in, in, in letting it go this long, um, but I would definitely have, um, have a lot of confidence that it will get resolved in our favour. Thank you, BVM. Okay, we are into the last part of. We'll take, I think we'll take one or two more questions maybe uh, before we finish. Obviously, there's been a lot of people here tonight. There's one or two more questions. Anyone got one for the top table? Now's your chance. Gentlemen here. Could you name a question, please, sir? <laughs> Hiya, uh, Stuart Wildman. Uh, the question I wanted to ask is, you alluded about the future about getting new training facilities going forward, and then tonight you just showed how hard it is for the club to make sustainable and the battles that you have. Uh, and you mentioned about an external partner coming in. I was just wondering how far the club were on in progressing with that, whether it's just discussion, dialogue, or it's quite advanced and there's plans and, and everything else with it. Yeah, I'll try and answer that for you. Um, we've been asking the council for years now to find us a site and thankfully they've come up with a suggestion uh, for a site in Harewood and we're talking to some developers um, who will probably have a plan in place within the next three to four weeks. It's really dependent on, because the site in, is in a greenbelt area, <coughs> uh, the developers need us uh, to be able to develop a housing de development on it. As part of that, planning authorities have told us that if they are prepared to provide us with a facility, then they think that they could probably get it through as a planning application. So we're working with them, the Midlands-based firm. Um, we walk the walk, uh, it's, it's a good site. There's a lot of work doing it, but we've asked for <coughs> Probably something we won't get, but we've asked for six pitches, and uh, <coughs> we hope that the plans will be available uh, to go forward within the next two or three weeks. It's just early stages yet, but it's it's been a long, a long, long haul trying to get a piece of land in Rochdale. The council have been very, very helpful, and the chief planning officer actually um, put us in touch with these people, 
And as I said, because they want to develop, uh, there's not, there could well be an opportunity. Um, I know I've seen the, the message board saying, why, why are we going for a training ground? Um, why don't we put it into more money into the first team? Or if you ask Brian, I'm sure he'll tell you why you need the training ground. We have a good academy, and we're grateful they have to train in a different area to the first team. And in an ideal world, they train together. They play together. <coughs> So even in, even in a situation that we've got, we're doing remarkably well with the academy, but we want to bring them together. And the people that say, well, it'd be more money, of course it'd be more money, but we think we can get a deal which will be very, very cheap in terms of the land and the development. Um, and again, I repeat, we've been dealing uh, with the chief planning officer who has been very, very helpful in the recent past. Uh, lots of council seem to have you know, taken a new liking to us. Um, but let's hope it continues. But um, it's probably a couple of years away. Uh, but I, I would like, I would hope to have some further information within the next three, four weeks.